Funding for this program is provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of the complete line of Cajun King seafood seasoning mixes and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Anytime, any place. In Louisiana, we're really cooking. Chef John Falls welcoming you to the bayous of South Louisiana. Today, Cajun and Creole cooking holds a prime spot in the world of international cuisine, and I would love for you to know a little bit about it. So why not sit back, relax, and join me and some of my friends as we cook up another great taste of Louisiana. Welcome to A Taste of Louisiana. I'm Chef John Falls, and today we're cooking Cajun and Creole. I know you can tell from this accent that I know a lot about Cajun and Creole cooking. Having come from the bayous of South Louisiana, Cajun cooking actually pumps through these veins. However, when I want to really talk about cooking Creole, I go into the city of New Orleans and visit with one of the greatest Creole chefs in existence in that city, a lady who's been called the queen of Creole cooking, Leah Chase, the owner of Dookie Chase's restaurant, and she's going to come and visit with me today, and I just can't wait to see her and hug that great old friend of mine. But let's talk about Cajun for just a second. You know, the Cajuns, for those of you who may not know, were the French refugees who left the coastal areas of France around 1620 to settle the land of Acadie in Canada, right on the Bay of Fundy. And these Acadians, as they were known, came to Louisiana and set up their little Cajun cottages right on the bayous. Here we have a nice Cajun cabin right along the side of one of those bayous built all out of cypress. And look at that beautiful cypress shake roof sitting on the top of it. Of course, water was everywhere. And here we see a foot ferry coming across the bayous. I remember riding one of these as a young kid as the ferry brought visitors over from one side to the other to visit with the Cajun families. Boats, of course, were the main means of transportation in the bayous. Here we see a pirog, not only used for hunting and fishing, but also for transportation to church and to the store or wherever else the Cajuns had to go. Everyone had a job in Bayou Country. Here we see a basket weaver making just one of these nice baskets. And here, oh, this guy's making furniture. Actually, this is a cypress table leg that's gonna go on one of the cypress tables in a Cajun cabin. What beautiful old furniture they used to make. The spinning wheel, we're spinning wool. And this is what the clothes of the Cajuns are gonna be made out of. And then it'll be dyed with the natural vegetation from the bayous of South Louisiana, all that blue and white uh, clothes that you see the Cajuns wearing. Here we see the blacksmith, and I don't think he's making horseshoes here. I think he's making a trivet for one of those Cajun kitchens, or he could be making a boot jack, or just a, maybe a piece of cooking utensil, a fork, or a spoon. Everything was made right in the village blacksmith shop uh, in all the little Cajun communities up and down the bayous. Here we see a little herb garden, a little vegetable garden at one of the more affluent Cajun cottages. You can see just how beautiful this is in the subtropical climate of South Louisiana. Allows us to grow all kind of great, nice, fresh herbs and vegetables everywhere, all during the year. Yep, and here it is, another little Cajun garden right outside the back door of the cottage. And you can see, I guess they're picking beans and vegetables. And since food was such a major part of all Cajun communities, Naturally, the gardens were everywhere, and friends came over to help to make sure that the produce was picked quickly to bring into the Cajun kitchens. Here's one of those kitchens with everybody lending a hand. I think it's a little lemonade or something being made, and in the back, somebody making filet powder in one of those old mills, browning fresh coffee. I think this is coffee beans. They're just being ground, ready to go into that coffee pot. And talking about pots, look at these black iron pots of the Cajuns fired on top with hot coals probably with a big pot of jambalaya or gumbo just sizzling away, all those great, great aromas in the Cajun kitchen, uh, ready for supper tonight. All of these great scenes are coming to us from Vermilionville, a Cajun Life Museum in Lafayette, Louisiana. We talk about black iron pots, and let's talk Cajun cooking for a second. I want to cook for you this morning the first dish, uh, which will be a Cajun dish. It's going to be 
seafood gumbo, the premier soup of Cajun cooking. And we'll talk a little bit about where gumbo came from, but let's get this old black iron pot fired up here. I've got a nice uh, big pot of uh, seafood stock. The stock was made earlier today. And in this stock pot, I have the shells of crawfish, crab, shrimp, all of those wonderful things that we can use to flavor water to make a much nicer soup or stew uh, than just putting plain water into the pot. These old black iron pots that the Cajuns use constantly in Louisiana really hold the heat well. And when trying to create the dark brown roux of the Cajuns, nothing is better than this old black iron pot. So as it starts to get warm, I'm going to take this wonderful old bottle here. You know, this is actually the oil bottle of a Model A Ford back in Louisiana in the early days, and I just love it. And I'm going to put about three quarters of a cup of vegetable oil. Now, of course, you can use any oil that you would like. If you want some of the light oils, feel free to use it. But whenever we use roux in Louisiana in the early days, we used animal fat like lard or one of the saturated fats. Of course, today we're getting away from it and going to more of the lighter oils that, we're, uh, that you see in the roux pots. Once the oil gets to about 350 degrees or about 375 degrees, we will add equal parts of flour. And the flour and oil together in the pot will create the roux that is so important to Cajun cooking. Into this oil now, I'm going to go in, as I said, with an equal part. I'm going to put about three quarters of a cup out of this beautiful old antique bowl that we picked up somewhere in the bayous. I'm going to put the flour right into the oil and slowly stir it. Now, in old days, we used one of the blue porcelain spoons to mix the oil and the flour together in the pot. And as the oil got up to the 375 degrees, the roux would cook to different stages of color. Now, of course, we do have a lot of different colors in the Cajun roux today. Some are very dark, dark brown. Others are very light, as in vegetables, which I'm going to show you a little early on, uh, a little uh, later on. And you can see how the oil is coming to a bubble in here, really starting to cook quickly. I'm going to turn that fire all the way up to make sure we have maximum heat on the bottom of that skillet. And what we're trying to do with the roux is very simple. In addition to, the, to coloring the gumbo, we're also going to add the nutty flavor to it that's so important in any dish in Louisiana cooking. Gumbo came to us from the coastal areas of France where the French made their wonderful bouillabaisse. And that bouillabaisse came to New Orleans in the late 1600s. And from there, the gumbo was created into the pot. Once the uh, roux takes on the color that we're looking for, I'm going to add into this all of the vegetables of Cajun cooking onion, celery, bell pepper, garlic, all need to go into this pot to give the natural flavors of Cajun cooking. And you're going to see a tremendous amount of vegetables going into the Cajun pots. The reason for that is very simple. Having uh, a lot of wild game and seafood to choose from in the bayous, we constantly wanted to add new flavor because we got tired of just those wild game tastes or the very bland taste of seafood. So we wanted to cover it up with a lot of different vegetable seasonings, and that's the reason for all of the great, great uh, flavor of onion, celery, bell pepper. But it's also the reason for some of the misconceptions about Cajun cooking. People feel that Cajun cooking needs to be hot and spicy, and not necessarily. There's a difference between spice and seasoning. Seasonings are all these natural, beautiful uh, 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 vegetable flavorings that you see on the table here. This is what we refer to as seasonings. When we talk about spice, we're talking about the, all of the, the spice, the red peppers and the bay leaves and all of those wonderful things that we talk about when we talk about spicy Cajun cooking. But very big misconception in our cuisine about it being very hot. Okay, now that the roux is starting to turn uh, brown, normally I would let it get to a nice golden dark color here. But for demonstration purposes, I'm going to show you now that the roux is, uh, the flour and oil is beginning to separate. So into that, I'll put oh, about a cup of onions, and the onions will uh, stop the roux from cooking, so we won't have a, uh, a problem with the roux scorching and giving a bitter taste to the gumbo. Onion, celery, those beautiful celery, green onions. You can see all of those great flavors going into the pot. Just really, really nice. Into that, garlic, because garlic is the premier seasoning of Louisiana. One nice spoon, maybe another one. Let's give it two. I'll stir that around instantly. And then into that, the seafood stock that we've been cooking all morning long. And I'll ladle in a couple of those wonderful ladles of nice 
flavorful stock, and look how hot that is. And I'll stir that around, and I'll continue to add a little more stock until I get to the desired thickness that I'm looking for. I'll continue to add. Look how hot that is. Woo! Hot cooking. I'll actually lower this just a little bit now. Okay, and then I'll continue to add the stock until the gumbo is the consistency that I'm looking for. And once all of the stock is into the roux and I've got the right consistency, I'm going to add my seafoods to it. And it's very important that we add a multitude of different seafoods in Louisiana gumbo. So I'm going to start with shrimp. And now you have to remember that the stock is already well flavored with this seafood. I'll add some beautiful 21, 25 pound shrimp, some great pretty oysters. Look how pretty these oysters are. Fresh shucked oysters this morning, a little bit of oyster liquor. And then some beautiful crab meat. Look how nice that crab meat is right into the soup. And into that, I'll add another ladle of hot stock because I'm looking for the right consistency in the soup. And it's got to be a nice, thick broth. And look, I'll add that around. And then onions, uh, then green onions, parsley, and a touch of red bell pepper for color. I'll add that around. And again, you can see the multitude of different seasonings and vegetables going into the pot. Now, we won't season this with salt and pepper just yet because we want the flavors to come together naturally in the pot, and then we'll uh, worry about seasoning later. So I'll allow that to cook again for about another 15 minutes. I'll turn on this little back burner here real, real low, and I'll put the gumbo right onto that pot, right onto that flame, and let that cook while we do our Creole version of a, of a similar dish. And the Creole version that we're going to do this morning is a dish called etouffee. And anything etouffee in Louisiana cooking is smothered, just as you saw in the gumbo, with onions, celery, bell pepper, garlic, green onions, anything smothered into the pot to create a wonderful flavor in the black iron skillets is etouffee. Etouffee comes from the French word to smother. I'm going to start off by putting into the pot a little bit uh, butter or, or margarine, whatever you would prefer to use. The Creoles did not begin with the dark brown roux as the Cajuns did. The Cajuns were looking for that hearty flavor in the bayous of Louisiana. The Creoles, on the other hand, were looking for a little more of the, uh, let's say, classical cooking because they came from all of the great nations of Europe, all the second-born sons, to settle the city of New Orleans in the early 60, in the late 1600s. And they brought with them to New Orleans all the great cooking styles of Europe, and not only the knowledge, but the cooks and the spices to create the dishes. So that's what Creole cooking is all about. Creole comes from the Spanish word Creole, which means a mixture of color. So we're going to see a lot of mixtures of color into this great pot right here uh, of the Creoles. Let's add to fade today a little bit of uh, seafood, just as we did in the gumbo. I'm going to start off again by putting a little bit onions. Same thing as we did in the gumbo a minute ago without the dark brown roux. The Creoles were a little bit different. They're going to put a little celery into it, a little bell pepper into the pot, as simple as that. And then, of course, again, the Creoles would have never begun a dish without the great garlic that they had to have in every dish that they cooked, just like the Cajuns. Into that, red bell pepper. They were looking for that classical color of Europe into the pot. And then, of course, some bay leaves. They liked the spice that was available in the bayous, so they found the bay leaves. So we're going to saute the vegetables or etouffee the vegetables around. And while they're cooking, I'm going to cut just a little piece of andouille to put into the gumbo because that's where the great smoked flavor of the gumbo is going to come from. And andouille is the Cajun ham that's cooked inside of the casing and smoked heavily with pecan wood and sugar cane to give the great flavor of smoke that the Cajuns depended on in their gumbos and soup. So I'll add this into the pot, and I'll lower that fire just a little bit while I'm etouffeeing my vegetables. And once they're etouffeed, I'll add the same thing we did in the gumbo. The Creoles had the same ingredients available to them, so they added the shrimp. Naturally, we can add a little bit of the smaller shrimp because we're looking for a great shrimp flavor in the etouffee the smothering of all these seafoods and vegetables. Into that, beautiful oysters, fresh shucked. 
I'm going to put lump crab meat into it also, the same way we did with the other dish. And the only difference here is crawfish. We're going to add fresh crawfish tails into the dish because crawfish is always in season in Louisiana, and we want to make sure that we put crawfish in our Creole pot. So just think of what's in this pot already. Onions, celery, bell pepper, garlic, green onions, all of those wonderful things, shrimp, oysters, crawfish, crab meat. How can it not be good? Let me lower this. Boy, I tell you what, these black pots really know how to cook. Now, the Creoles would have had to add a roux into the pot at some times. They wouldn't have used the dark brown roux of the Cajuns, but they would have done something quite simple. Into the pot, they would have taken fresh flour and sprinkled just to pick up some of the butter in the bottom of the pot. And that butter and flour will act as a thickening agent in the pot. So we'll stir that around just a little bit. And we're going to add some fresh tomato product to it. I have some tomato sauce right here because the Creoles wanted a tomato look. They used a lot of tomatoes in Creole cooking. So we're going to use a little tomato sauce, fresh tomato sauce. And we'll stir that around for a minute to blend it all in. And then the stock, the hot shellfish stock, just as we did with the gumbo. And I'll ladle this stock right into the pot. The flour will thicken the hot stock instantly. And of course, that's what we're looking for, a nice uh, pink colored sauce that's etouffeeing or smothering the onions, celery, bell pepper, shrimp, the beautiful, beautiful fresh shuck oysters, the crawfish, the lump crab. Look at the color in that pot, just how nice it is. That's an etouffee dish. So I'll continue to stir that. And I'll come back in and season the soup. And the soup will now pick up the smoke of the andouille. The soup will now have the great flavor of the crawfish and crab meat. And I'm going to put into it a pinch of cracked black pepper. I'm going to put into the gumbo just a little touch of salt and stir that around for a minute. And I have some gumbo already done down here so we don't have to wait for that one. And uh, look how pretty the sauce is coming in this etouffee pot. All of the natural juices of the seafoods are just starting to permeate the center of this black iron pot. And the great seafood flavor is coming into this dish a mile a minute. It's just fantastic. If you could only smell this dish, it's wonderful. Now, again, a little pepper into that pot, a little salt. And we'll stir that around for a minute. And the etouffee is just about done. So I'll move the stock off. I'll put the etouffee on this nice low fire here. And I'll cook a quick, quick dish in Louisiana, a vegetable that I wanted to show you, because we love vegetables here. And I would never attempt to do a vegetable in Louisiana without sauteing the vegetables in a little onion, celery, and bell pepper. Again, we're looking for great flavor. So I want to lift that fire up just a little bit. And into the butter, I'm going to put, again, onions. Put a little onions into it, a little celery a little bell pepper, and I'm going to put some butter beans cooking into this pot, some fresh shuck butter beans once the vegetables are all sauteed. And I'm going to put them right down into there. Even our vegetables are cooked with vegetables. And I'm going to put a little smoked sausage down into the pot also, because we have to have some good smoked sausage. And I promised you a little early on that I was going to bring out to visit the greatest of all Creole chefs in the city of New Orleans. And Leah Chase has been a wonderful friend of mine for a long time. And while all of these dishes are cooking away, I'm going to have that great, great chef come out and visit with us. And we're going to do one of her favorite dishes, a dish that I've eaten in her restaurant uh, many times. And I know she's back there somewhere. So I want to bring out the queen of Creole cooking, Leah Chase. Leah, where are you? Come on out here, sweetheart. Look at you. You're <laughs> Great, good to have you with oh, us good. today. What you cooking? Oh, Ooh, doesn't it smell good. great? Yeah, you know, great. you have been in New Orleans for so long. You've had a fabulous restaurant there. You still do. How long have y'all been cooking in New Orleans? Uh, Quite a long time. Forty-nine years. Oh, Forty-nine years. Of course, years. I don't look that old. No, you sure don't. You, you look fantastic. <laughs> Forty-nine you know, years. Every time I go in your restaurant, there's celebrities from all over the world. Huh? Who, who's, who's the greatest person you ever served? I don't want to get uh, you in trouble, but who? <laughs> 
Who is that person? I yeah. want to know. That's hard to say because <laughs> we serve so many people. We served Lena Hahn, Sarah Vaughn, you name it, Duke Ellington, King Cole when he was alive, everybody. Oh, geez. Uh, we served his daughter and you, not everybody. You know, I saw, I saw the other day that there was a Leah Chase Day in the city of New Orleans. You know, I, yeah. I want to know how can I get my name in spotlight. So. <laughs> You gotta know the right people, Joe, and that's it. You don't know the right people. Well, I was that at was Leah's, fun. That was really fun. I was at Leah's restaurant about oh a, a, a week or so ago. You may want to hold that and stir my pot with that napkin. I was in Leah's restaurant about a week or so ago, and I had the greatest dish I think I've ever had of its type in the city of New Orleans. And that dish was called shrimp ramelade. And there's as many recipes for ramelade as there are restaurants and people who create ramelade. But Leah, I have to tell you. Your ramelade was one of the finest, finest in the world. How many different recipes do you know for ramelade? Well, there are many. Some people make a white ramelade. Some people, uh, like we do, we make a, what we call a red ramelade. And a little red in your life is good. <laughs> you know, put a little color there. Well, 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 I can say that it had some distinct tastes that were a little bit different from what we do in the bayous. But right. still in all, it was, uh, it was absolutely fabulous. And... Uh, stole your cookbook while I was there. Oh, you and, did? Yeah, and right. actually, it's a great, great cookbook. And Thank I'm you. following some of the uh, uh, little rules and regulations. And you told me you never cook by rules and regulations. That was a great little story <laughs> you told me. What, what did you say about rules? Yeah, stuff? well, <laughs> rules, you know. This old woman used to compare all of her cooking to religion, you know. <laughs> and she said, rules don't make a cook. No more dead sermons make a saint. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you Maybe what. You I followed some of your rules to make this ramelade, and, and you're going to have to tell me. I want to put a little bit of my style and a little bit of your style All into right. the pot. Now, what I started here with was about, oh, oh a cup of mayonnaise or so, and your recipe called, of course, for celery, celery. dice, real, real right. fine. We're going to put into the pot some beautiful green onions into the pot because you yeah. had a lot of color in your oh, ramelade. Yeah, that green onion. Isn't that yeah. nice? You had some red bell pepper in your ramelade. Mm -hmm. Of course, we uh, always... A little tomato. You there, always have tomato in yours, but you know what I always have in mind? Creole, Creole mustard. mustard. So uh -huh. I'm going to put a little yeah. Creole mustard, that nice and, spicy mustard yeah. from New Orleans. You're put a little yellow mustard, too, in, if you didn't like the spicy cream. Ooh, that Isn't that pretty? Good. And then Ooh. we're going to put a squeeze of lemon into it, just right. like that. Isn't that nice? Yeah. And put a squeeze of lemon into it. And the lemon is going to give it just that great, great, yeah. great flavor. And as we... Give it a little more tomato, John. More, more tomato? Well, tomatoes. I tell you, hey, this is your recipe yeah. I've stolen here. Yeah. And, and as I say, there's there so go. many different recipes for ramelade, yeah. but it's a yeah. dish that's so simple to do. And we boiled the shrimp earlier today. You can see these big, beautiful shrimp. And what we did, Leah, I took the shrimp and I, I put a little pot of water boiling and I put salt and pepper and lemon juice, a couple bay leaves. I know there's a lot of commercial uh, right. spices on the market for boiling shrimp, but I peel them first, devein them, and put them into that boiling right. hot water just for a minute. Yeah, and you don't want to get them too soft. You want them crunchy, and they look good. And you don't want to overcook yeah. them. I no. think these probably cooked about three or four that's minutes all. at, that's the, all you at need the absolute on that, most. About four minutes. Uh, but I didn't boil them in the shell. I boiled them out of the shell, yeah. and they came out really nice. Now we have to. Season this, so we're going to season it with a little what? I'm going to put a little put salt a little and pepper. pepper. Do you want any? Yeah. I've got some thyme. I've got basil. Yeah. Just put These. a little salt and pepper in Okay, there. a little salt yeah. and pepper. Mm -hmm. going to stir that around a little bit. And what does it look good? Look how nice and pretty it is. I'm putting that finger in, mm -hmm. huh? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's good. Mm. That's good. Isn't that good? Now, mm -hmm. we can take this beautiful ramelade. Look how pretty that is. Oh, and let me get this old towel out of the way here. And what we're going to do is take the ramelade and pour right over the top of the shrimp. Isn't that magnificent? Mm, Look how pretty. beautiful that is. And I tell you what, if they don't like this, they don't know mm. what good Louisiana cooking is all about, huh? That's really good. Uh, this this uh, a recipe, by the way, I have to tell you, I've used in the restaurant a couple times, and it's absolutely mm. fantastic. Mm. I'm going to put a little touch yeah, of, pepper and a little bit there. paprika right on top of it. Give it a little color. Give it a little color. Leah? <laughs> Ooh, that looks good. Why don't you take a bite of that? Whew, is that good or what? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to stir these One pots. Good. I'm going to stir these pots so we don't uh, let them scorch. The butter beans are picking up that great smoked sausage flavor. And of course, I put onion, celery, bell pepper, and all those nice things. The etouffee, look how mm, pretty the etouffee, etouffee is. Good. And I'm going to put the etouffee in one of these beautiful patty shells. Mm -hmm. I'm going to put it right in there when we get ready to serve it. We're going to do that in a minute. And Leah, I hate to tell you this, 
But we've had so much fun. Time is out already. Oh. We've got the gumbo, the etouffee, the butter beans, the ramalot, and you and I mm. can stay and eat a little while. Right. But unfortunately, time flies in Cajun and Creole country when you're having a mm. good time. And all I can ask you is uh, uh, to come back and visit with us sometimes. And we're going to be doing a little taste of Louisiana from now on. So uh, great. Uh, yeah, y'all come great. back and see us sometime. Let's eat a little bit of this. <laughs> Funding for this program was provided in part by Bruce Foods Corporation, makers of Bruce's yams and other distinctive Louisiana-style food products. Additional funding is provided by the Louisiana Department of Culture, Recreation, and Tourism. Anytime, any place in Louisiana, we're really cooking. The companion cookbook to A Taste of Louisiana is available for $22.95. The Evolution of Cajun and Creole Cuisine by Chef John Fulce features recipes and food history behind Louisiana's cuisine. This 352-page cookbook contains over 250 recipes, including those from this show. To order, call 1-800-973-7246 or write to the address on your screen.